All righty, and we are live. Great. Oh, we're getting a lot of people joining the Hangout. This will be good. Hey, James Rice, how's it going? Damn. Whoa. All right, guys, if you're in the Hangout, just please make sure to mute yourselves while you're not talking, which is mostly when Amber is talking, so there's not background noise and you don't take over the main screen so people can see her when, and they can see whoever's talking. Um, Alrighty, so uh, welcome everyone to a very exciting Loeb Hangout. This is the last Hangout that we're doing before we're all going to actually be in Paris uh, on Tuesday. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. We're all working very hard here to get ready for Loeb Paris. Um, today we have Amber Case, who's a uh, cyborg anthropologist. It's like I had to actually go and look up like a few times when I first saw that <laughs> you were speaking. Um, and uh, we'll talk a lot more about what that is. Uh, she's also the former CEO of GeoLoki, um, which I just found out is because they were, they were acquired. So that's why she's no longer the CEO. So that's great news. Um, so Amber, do you want to take a second to just tell us a little bit more about who you are and what a cyborg anthropologist is? <laughs> yeah, sure. So... Um... Hey everybody, uh, I'm Amber Case. I've been studying the interaction between humans and technology and then also trying to apply that by bringing the future of, of location-based technology to the market in some shape or form. Um, I really follow Mark Weiser from Xerox PARC, uh, his kind of 1970s idea of calm technology, the idea that technology is the all the way and humans and technology and, and also and trying to apply that I think I'm bringing the future of, oh, of location <laughs> technology to the market in some the shape or form. Let's see. Does everyone still hear me? I think I think I got caught in a feedback loop, which is kind of ironic. I think there was someone in the Hangout that was watching the video of the live stream oh, at the same okay. time. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> cool. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I've been very much a proponent of, of this idea of calm technology where technology gets out of the way, lets you live your life. <laughs> going to have to proactively mute everybody. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I started a company called Geoloki. It just got acquired by Esri. Um, it's been really fun just trying to figure out the future of technology and um, some of the issues. The thing that I'm really interested in, in terms of lay web Internet of Things, is to try and talk about the kind of Tower of Babel that's going on with all of our technology right now. We have all these different types of devices, and they all speak different languages. And there's not really a common language that stitches all of them together. And until we have a common protocol, if you think about, um, you know, I, I met one of the guys who made IMAP last night, um, and, you know, IMAP is one of the email protocols that allows you to um, access email from different devices and different email clients. And before that happened, everybody was writing their own email protocols. Um, the same with um, printers and computers. Until Interpress was invented, uh, which was by the guys from Adobe, there was no way to um, really send data from one type of computer to a different type of printer. So I think we're going to have the same experience with all the different devices that we're going to have. Um, you know, we have maybe a, a Nike tracker, and we've got phones, and we have little tiny sensors, and they're all speaking these different languages and protocols. And I think there's, you know, the thing that I argue is that there needs to be a common protocol um, for all of those things. And uh, one of the reasons why some of the stuff was made is because large companies couldn't really do it. They kept stalling. They kept trying to make it perfect. Um, also, when the web was very early, it was very... It was, it was comparatively easier because there were less people involved to try and change something um, and to try and make a new format. Um, so I think that that's something really important because you talk about tracking all these different things. My co-founder tracked his location at five-second intervals for four years now. Um, and, you know, he uses his phone to automatically notice that he's home and turn on the lights in the house when he gets there, and turn off the lights when he leaves. Um, but he has to take all these different devices and translate them. And he uses IRC, which was created in, I think, 1987. And it's a very low-weight framework for communication. Um, but I think, you know, the, the opportunity is not when we can take all this information from these specific devices, but when you can reach across and actually understand 
all of the different um, all the different data streams that are going on. So you know, if your sleep affects your weight, affects your health, affects you know things that are going on around you, um, and you can get this kind of long-term longitudinal study trying to make what was formerly invisible um, when you live your everyday life in real time and try to, and try to make it very visible. Um, so that's probably what I'm going to talk about a little, other than the in the than the cyborg stuff at uh, LayWeb. So, yeah, feel free to ask any questions. If you ask in the group chat, um, that will probably be a little bit easier than um, unmuting and, uh, and, and speaking up because of the background noise. Yeah, guys, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to moderate to keep everything organized. If you do have a question, please post it in the comments, and I'll call on you specifically so we don't have eight people unmuting themselves all at once and yelling at Amber. <laughs> um, all right, we already have one one person commented on the YouTube stream and said, uh, nice seeing you visualized. Tell us a story about those frames again. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, <laughs> well, these glasses, um, they're called parasites, and they stick to your face, basically. That's why they're called parasites. They were invented by an industrial designer who had a lot of friends who went rock climbing, and when these people with glasses went up to the top of the rock cliff, they would you know, invariably look down and some of them would drop their glasses and they'd have to you know, climb back down the rocks blind. Um, so this guy created these parasite glasses and what ended up happening is none of the rock climbers really bought them and they ended up being, you know, glasses that nerds like. And so um, they're sold in three places in the world, Tokyo, Paris, and, um, and Portland, Oregon, which I had no clue why. So I walked down the street to get glasses and they basically looked at me and put the glasses on my face in the store, and they said, "Hey, you look like a nerd. Where are these glasses?" So that's that's the story. <laughs> that's a good story. <laughs> um, cool. So I mean, it's it's really fascinating. Exactly what you're talking about is so often the common theme of pretty much every single hangout that we've done with the Internet of Things speakers. Um, they all are building either a product or a platform or both. Um, yeah. To, for these objects to communicate with uh, each other and um, with your phones and devices and with your homes. Um, they, and they, they're all trying to create their own kind of like open APIs and platforms so other people can build on top of it. Um, right. what, like what you're describing though, while it sounds like you know, that would be phenomenal if there was a standard across the board, um, it just seems like, like such a massive undertaking. Like mm -hmm. what, what would need to take place in order for that kind of uh, framework to exist? Well, I think it needs to be something that's tricky, right? So when I talked with the guy who made, uh, who helped make the IMAP and POP protocol for email, um, he had this particular process that was really funny and clever, and I cannot, I cannot remember how he did it, but the, but the idea was that he made it in such a way that everybody was forced to just use it, um, because there was so many different protocols going on at that point. And I think, you know, generally things in systems happen where something new happens, things get really, really, really complex. Like you can see this on the supermarket shelves. All of the advertising on, on and um, packaging gets really complex. And then in order to differentiate, things get really, really simple. Um, so it's the same with, you know, any of these smartphones, right? Um, for a while we got tons of buttons on the smartphones, really complex interfaces. And then, you know, a phone came in and just liquefied the interface and made everything really simple. So I think we're seeing, you know, that wave again happening with all these different protocols. Everyone's in their little silos saying, use my open API, use my open API. Um, and somebody just needs to say, let's do a really low level, um, you know, device language that's easy for everybody to use and join um, that either goes above all of them so that it doesn't matter what your local device is written in, but you can connect into this and it'll be a universal translator for all devices, or get everybody to install this low-level language on their device. I, I don't think everyone will install something. So I think as long as there's a protocol that everybody can go through, and there's a few that people can come up with, um, it will make a lot of sense. And the problem is, you know, the type of people that write stuff like that are pretty uncommon. Um, and of course, like it would be nice if it were written in something like assembly code, <laughs> because with so many connections, you need something really, really, um, really, really slick and written in a way that doesn't have a, a lot of abstractions. Um, because you know, once you have a device, 
um, the limitations of this, you know, the bandwidth limitations are so much that you, you know, because it's small and mobile all the time, you really can't do the things that you could do on the web where you have, you know, a site that loads and is really big and lots of data that comes through. So, um, so I don't know who will build it, but it needs to happen. And we saw the same thing happen with um, the printing industry. We saw the same thing happen with email. And we're going to have to have the same thing happen with devices before we can truly have an Internet of Things. Very interesting. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone watching on YouTube, ask questions in the comments. We're giving away a free ticket to the web to whoever asks the best question. If you could stump Amber, then you'll probably win. Um, so um, cool. Uh, so is anybody close to being able to accomplish that? Um, Mm, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen. I haven't seen anything that's that's cropped up yet. But I'm still looking, um, and uh, we'll see. I I hope that that's the challenge for next year. It's probably going to come from some really random, obscure place. I don't know if it'll come from academia or it'll come from somebody doing a startup, but it's probably going to come from some clever, unknown person, and everyone will be like, "Oh, that's totally obvious." Afterwards, um, but. Uh, you know, it might be somebody that has worked at a large company who's been frustrated for a while, who has been trying to build it and just hasn't worked and just does it in their free time. Um, so, yeah, so be on the lookout for that because the person who builds that or the people who build that are the people who follow. Why don't you build it? Why don't I build it? Well, <laughs> I kind of want to, but I, I don't know if I'm... Hmm, well, maybe in a few years. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. All right. I'll hold you to that. If, if no one else builds it in a few years, we're going to do yeah, another hangout. <laughs> i got to learn assembly or COBOL or something. Yeah, you know, <laughs> language like that. <laughs> a real language. Um, uh, Peter, you had a question? So going back to the cyborg stuff, how long do you think it'll take until most people in the developed world will have a piece of technology permanently integrated into their body? Also, what do you think what this piece of technology will be like? Okay. So this is... This is an, a strange question, but also a question I get a lot. Um, I am worried, and I don't like the idea of getting anything permanently integrated into my body. And there are a number of reasons why. I have to buy a new one of these phones every you know, year or two years. If I don't buy them, um, they start to break down and get really slow. And if I have it permanently attached to my body, I'll have to go to the Apple you know, Apple hospital care emergency room store or whatever, the Apple, you know, <laughs> medical program to get it uninstalled from my body and then, you know, have to download the physical support updates or what happens if the electrical system um, somehow is wired incorrectly and then I get shocks every time I walk down the street. What happens if it's connected to my vision and I get a blue screen? Um, it, uh, you know, it, it's really quite... Um, it's quite difficult. I, I, I like technology because it's you can take it out, you can turn it off, you can move it away from yourself, and you can always separate yourself from the technology. If it's completely connected to you, you can't ever get away from it. Um, you know, like clothing, right, or a car. You can choose the clothing you wear. You can upgrade, you can downgrade, you can change on the fly. It's not permanently attached to your body like fur. So because of that, you have extreme flexibility in how you want to present yourself, what you want to do, how you want to be, how you want to act. Same with cars. It should be the same way with technology. Now, the other case is if somebody, you know, there's this kind of scale in the middle, and the scale in the middle is like this. You've got normal, what it, what it means to be a normal human right here. And you have um, somebody who maybe has a deficit, like maybe they can't see or maybe they can't hear. Um, or maybe they have diabetes and they need an insulin pump attached to their body for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In that case, technology can be implanted in somebody like a, an ocular implant or, um, or an auditory assisting device, and it's okay. Um, once you get above that level, um, there's kind of these, these ethics issues that are going on where, well, how many people can actually have these implants that allow them to see like a superhuman, right? And we already have a lot of different superhuman capabilities with, with our technology as is. Um, I'm just worried about everybody being connected to implants because it's really great if you have a lot of money and you can always upgrade and you always have access to healthcare. But if you don't, you're going to have 
you know, your devices turn against you. And if they are attached to you, then your life isn't going to be very fun. Um, so I always look at the whole spectrum of things because there's never going to be a point where everybody is wealthy in the world. There's always going to be a spectrum of, of people. And the people at the lower end of the scale will have bad experiences with the technology. The people at the higher end will have great experiences with technology. Um, so that's, that's usually uh, how it starts, though, isn't it? With any kind of new technology. Yeah. And, it, and it, always, it will always happen and always stay the same. So although, you know, I'd love to see, I think there'll be, a, mostly everybody in the world will have some sort of mobile phone and be using that. The, the great flexibility of the, of the devices is that you can interchange them. Humans last for 80 years. Humans as, you know, their source code, their DNA lasts for a really long time. Technology is, you know, a shorter lifetime of any other creature that I've ever seen. It's less than a dog, less than a bird. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's less than a table. You know, you can pass a table down generation to generation if it's built well. You can't pass a phone down from a generation to a generation. It, it, it's, it's done, you know. And technology isn't the same shape over time. It kind of evaporates and doesn't keep its same shape. This will look different in 10 years. It looked like a giant warehouse, you know, in the 1960s and 70s. Really cool stuff. Um, we, have a, we have a question from YouTube from Andy Sig. They said, Amber, you've talked a lot about the wormhole nature of modern communication. What aspect of human interaction do you think has benefited most from this and what has suffered in your view? And maybe you can explain it to those of us who have no idea what he's talking about. Sure. Um, so the, <laughs> okay, so the idea of a wormhole. So I give this example where, you know, my dad sat me down. He said, what's the shortest distance between two points? And I said, oh, it's a straight line. You told me that yesterday. And he said, no, no, no. It's actually a curved line. And he took a piece of paper like this and he put point A and point B on it, and he folded it together, and he said, that's the shortest distance between two points. And so I really wanted to make a wormhole when I was a kid, and I was trying to figure out, how do I compress and fold space-time? Well, uh, when I started researching cell phones, I realized that you can be anywhere, on any side of the world, whisper something and be heard on the other, and that this, when you connect to someone um, through, you know, just talking with them on the phone, you're technically making this kind of techno-social wormhole where you're collapsing space and time, right? You're, you're, they're near to you, and you're near to them, but you aren't actually going anywhere. And so it's kind of like this collapse of, of geography temporarily, and then, you know, you can speak with them, and then you can just hang up, and the wormhole goes back to not being a wormhole anymore. Um, so in some ways, it's been very useful. Um, I, I usually give the example of the landline telephone was great. You could sit in a room and, you know, nice room, uh, you can sit on the phone, maybe two hours, you have privacy, there aren't giant trucks driving by, people aren't, you know, talking next to you, you're not on the bus, you're not moving. So you can have a really focused talk. Um, once the cell phone becomes untethered from a connection, um, you know, from its cord, then you suddenly had this issue where that room um, that you used to have didn't exist anymore. You could just walk outside and be on the phone. And so you kind of have this this issue of noise pollution all the time. Um, it's kind of like having a peeing section in a swimming pool. There's no point. It's going to, you know. Um, so, so the idea is that, um, that we have to have this temporary negotiated private space now when we make a little tiny wormhole between us and somebody else. If you're sitting on the bus or in an airport next to somebody on a phone, you're actually sitting next to somebody, not one person, but one and a half people. And that extra virtual person that's taking up the space there and causing that person to speak more loudly and not understand their surroundings is really obnoxious. And so I think that's, um, you know, the cell phone etiquette that, that we have is, is really important. I wish there were cell phone booths that you could just go into now um, and, you know, speak quietly, just like the telephone booth. Um, but now actual telephone booths, if you see them around, they've taken the glass off because the only people who use telephone booths anymore are often drug dealers. So they want to be able to monitor their calls. <laughs> so you don't get privacy anymore in society as much. And I, I actually want to go around and record what I call the modern day soliloquy. When somebody walks down the street jabbering away on their phone and yelling at somebody, you get a one-sided conversation and it's fascinating to watch because um, you can make eye contact with them, you can make faces at them, they will not be deterred from their conversation. 
It's really cool to think about that too. I mean, from the simple concept of just talking to someone on a cell phone, but soon we're going to have things like Google Glass and things where people are connected to so much more than what's in their immediate surroundings, and that's just going to separate them so much more from their immediate surroundings. Yeah, or hopefully amplify. I, I like the idea of diminished reality instead of augmented reality, where you can filter out the stuff that you don't want. Um, Steve mm. Mann in the 1980s created a way to do ad block, so he had a heads-up display like the Google Glass that well it weighed 80 pounds, including the battery pack. Um, but he would be able to identify advertisements and then cancel them out in real time and see text messages and other messages from his friends on it. And he said, why do I have to go through reality and see other people's messages? I'd just like to see my own. That's really cool. I want to buy that right now. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, Daniel, did you want to ask a question? You can unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, Amber. Thanks for taking this. Um, I was really enjoying like the GeoLocky suite of apps and some of the features you were playing with there. For example, like leaving notes in places and then being alerted to them when you got there later, which is great if you're kind of not very mindful and you hate lists because you can drop things in places and then be reminded. Um, we're trying to do some fun stuff like that as well. I wanted to really just ask you, um, what's the coolest feature or the most ambitious feature you've wanted to build, but the tech just isn't there yet? Ah, good question. Um, well, hmm. there's been a lot. I, I guess I really want you to be able to, with your mobile device, be able to go anywhere um, and automatically get the information about what's available, what actions are available around you. So not just messages, but actions. So when I get near my house, I want to get the actions of, you know, turn off and on the lights, unlock the door or not, um, so that I can click on them and usually, and basically use my phone as a remote control for reality. Um, until there's a common protocol for all the different devices and how they speak, it's really hard to do that because you have to have, you know, it, and it would be really nice, you know, the, one of the earliest, earliest visions of GeoLocky was just to be that kind of thin protocol where you'd have one app and all these different things that we called layers and all of the devices that you had and your entire reality would fit into these layers and you could subscribe to various aspects of reality. So you'd walk into a restaurant, be like, hey, the menu's available, click on the menu order and then automatically get it charged to your account without you having to do anything or split a bill or anything and you'd get the order perfectly because you entered it in. And so then you'd have the hospitality of, you know, the waiter or the waitress, and they could pay attention to you and, and actually help you out, right? Um, in Japan, it works very similarly. There are a vending machine restaurants where when you go in, you actually press what you want, and it's all just um, images, so you don't even have to know Japanese. You just click on what you want, and this button's on this machine. It gives you tickets, and you go into the restaurant, and there are these... Um, just, you know, you sit in a row, and it's actually quite private. It's, they're quiet ramen restaurants, and you put the tickets under this little uh, counter thing, and they make your food, and they bring it back out, and it's perfect because, you know, you already ordered, but you don't have any issues with translation. You don't have any issues with actually them screwing up your order, and it's for people that live in a society that there are so many people around them that they just want some quiet time to themselves. So there's no phones allowed, no computers, no talking, and you just sit there quietly contemplating, you know, and eating your food. Um, but the idea is that everything's handled up front. You know, all your actions are done up front. So not only can people get more people in, there's less stress involved with ordering. Um, so things like that, it's kind of a reverse, and maybe it could be a little bit alienating, but it works out really well in terms of relaxation when people have so many social interactions during the day and so many decisions that they have to make. Cool, thank you. We have a, a question here from Jeremy Charoy on YouTube. Uh, he said, Amber, how do you think connected mobile phones will impact people, uh, people's life in emerging countries, especially these people who did not live with computer internet before? Oh, great. Um, so good question. Uh, well, it's already impacted people's life tremendously. One of the great things about, so in, in a place like America, you have an entire infrastructure of phone lines and the internet um, and, uh, and computers kind of happened because all those phone lines were there and we had dial-up and things like that. Uh, a lot of those countries don't have the ability to have that infrastructure quite yet. Um, also, a lot of people live in a place where you just can't have a computer. You don't have the ability to have that much power going into a machine. Um, and something that's mobile is 
much better. So people are just jumping directly from mobile, from having no computers at all, because it's lightweight, easy to charge, the battery lasts a little bit longer. And I heard a story of um, of uh, you know a, a little village that had no internet access or no mobile connection, and yet they had phones. And so uh, um, one of the chiefs would charge up the phone, write a message to a neighboring tribe on the phone, give it to a runner. This kid would physically run the phone to deliver the message to somebody else because they couldn't actually send a message between the village. Um, so even you know even that. Uh, people are finding weird tricks around it. Um, it's really good against corruption. It's really good for, there's a lot of mobile banking going on and microloans that are going on that people can access directly through those phones. It's pretty incredible, and it's all done on little feature phones. Um, a lot of SMS. Um, it's, it's really quite clever, and I love the system because there aren't that many resources, so you get clever solutions versus, you know, the phones that we have right now, you know, in, you know, in kind of these more developed countries. They have so many features and so much overhead, and they're so expensive that the solutions aren't as clever as they could be. And I really like people who work under constraints because, you know, the cleverness just shows up in that way. It's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, the Russians building um, space spaceships and, and, you know, NASA trying to build spaceships. You know, one has two million moving parts and the other one has maybe 20. And you know, the failures um, are very obvious in one, so you can fix them easily. And the other ones require a giant support force. Great. Uh, Franco, did you have a, you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Hello, Amber. Franco from Digitalia.fm. It's an Italian tech show. Uh, I read uh, the article on The New Yorker by Gary Marcus, uh, which is, uh, the title is Google's Driverless Cars and Morality. And uh, it says we are building these connected things system that uh, integrates these these signals from the real world and take decision on our part. Sometimes these decisions will have important moral implication, like uh, I'm in a Google car on my on the highway, something bad happens, and uh, the CPU has to decide in milliseconds if it's better to avoid eating uh, two kids on the road and jumping off the cliff and kill me. Or to right. spare my life and kill the kids. Some it 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 will happen. It do will. you think do you think humanity is ready to delegate this kind of decision to a machine? Or should society talk about this now and make the, the right decision? Or like it always happens, let things go and sort out the problems later after they start the beginning happening? This is a, a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, well I actually was given um, a book called Ethics and Android Epistemology or something like that. It was this large book on um, on military Android control systems for drones and how decisions are made and all the algorithms for making decisions. Um, you know, a lot of that is used for the driverless cars. Well, the solution is just to make the cars capable of flying or disappearing and transporting to another place. That's lazy as, a, as an answer to this question. There, you know, people are going to love the driverless car until somebody gets killed, right? And then we'll have this ethics argument again. But I think, I mean, we have this tremendous problem of drunk driving in America because, you know, and maybe it's attributed to the, the fact that the drinking age is so, um, so high that it's actually very difficult to um, actually experience alcohol responsibly at a young age. Um, and so people end up, you know, driving and drinking and killing a lot of people, right? So I would like to have it where if it automatically notices that you're, um, you know, that you're drunk, that it could do some automatic things for you because your judgment technically is impaired. Um, but of course there's going to be issues, you know, deciding between throwing you off a cliff and killing two kids. I have no idea how to solve those problems. And um, you know, we might get tragic stories, but the thing is, a person is going to have to decide that as well, right? And so the person might make a horrible decision and instead turn around the car and kill 50 people, right? And there's no knowing, you know, in, in, that, in that decision space. You know, the other thing is the car could just stop and kill the people behind it um, or kill everybody, right? So I don't know, and, and it's a big moral dilemma. Um, I think that... 
cars are dangerous enough and there are way more accidents in cars that it's a great thing to automate <laughs> because if it can reduce the amount of deaths over time um, and it can give people control back, that's great. The thing that I worry about is that if there's a bunch of driverless cars, um, people are going to end up, um, I guess people are going to end up not being able to actually drive anymore, right? Um, you, you'll have like a generation of people that remember how to drive, you'll have an elite that can drive off-road with their own recreational vehicles, with their own special licenses, and um, and then you'll have this group of people that doesn't know how to drive anymore, right? And I think that's going to be an issue in case, you know, what happens if the system goes offline or is hacked, you know, is the system made um, by a central decision-making process or is it distributed? Um, who has the laws of the system? Who decides... Um, you know, one of the things is who decides which laws to implement in their municipality, right? So you, you're going to have a bunch of different uh, cities and state decisions and national decisions, and you're going to have all sorts of disclaimers and, you know, the standard stuff in reality that's going to, to regulate the industry and lots of taxes and fees and things like that. But if at the end state you can prevent a lot of people from dying and you can get up. You know, because honestly, a lot of airplanes are very automated at this point. A lot of decisions are made for people in airplanes. Um, and pilots are trained to have backup education. So as long as people have, you know, if they're trained with backup understanding of how to drive, it might be okay, but we might have this vestigial, um, we might lose that ability, right? So, you know, the, the plane industry, deaths from planes are so low, so, so, so low. It's one of the safest places to be, is in the air in a plane at 600 miles an hour. Um, and one of the most unsafe places to be is a car. So I would welcome the, the robotic car driving overlords if it meant that, um, that I were less likely to die. Because um, I take more planes than drive cars, actually. I, I like bikes. So what we could do is just have a bunch of self-driving cars for the really boring commute in the morning, and then there could be a bunch of of bicyclists. We can have a bunch of different bike-friendly uh, cities and roads and tunnels um, because bike accidents, you know, are generally not as severe and if we keep them out of the way of cars and they're self-driving cars, way less likely to um, to have deaths in that in that situation. So that's my, you know, that's my view of, you know, a utopian society in the future. Who knows if it'll happen or not or, you know, some random hacker kids will hack into it and make all the cars drive into the shape of, you know, a, you know, a swear word or something like that and take a picture from, from Google Maps and post it on Instagram and get a lot of points. Um, I, I assume that there's going to be a lot of silly pranks in the future from things like this, and that's how you know a system is working when people start playing pranks with it and start trying to abuse it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. I the concept always makes me think of like in Minority Report where they have everything on a set grid and system so you can't even drive off of it really and then yeah. if you're like going to get arrested you really just like have to sit back and get arrested you can't even run away. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I love the idea of the Wild West, you know, I want to ride off in a car into the sunset and <laughs> go on. What's going to happen in movies without car chases? <laughs> oh yeah, car chase, well you, you have to, so the thing in a, in a movie with a car chase um, you buy on the black market a disruptor chip that automatically <laughs> um, uh, disorients your car and allows you to get off the grid, and then you have full control of your car. Um, and but then you know that's the other thing. If only cops and security officials have the ability to actually drive their cars, um, then that will make a really bad power differential. So the question is when to allow that, because then you'll have abuse of power. Um, you know, much more than just eating donuts all the time, you'll have. <laughs> driving anywhere and you know and of course the wealthy will have the ability to drive their own cars which is why boats are actually the best things because on a boat there's no grid so you can do whatever you want on a boat so I would I would suggest everyone just gets boats and then we'll be you know then there's no grid uh, water world style <laughs> water world style <laughs> we'll, we'll, warming, we'll have water world after that. there you go well I, I'm afraid to ask you this question because I feel like I'm going to get a much more serious answer than I get from any of the other uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs that we we've interviewed here but we we joke around with like Spiro and like a couple of these other like Lockatron like what if the what if machines actually are able to what if they take over and their <laughs> Spiros are running around and the Lockatrons lock you all out of your homes and like everyone usually laughs and just shrugs it off but I feel like you probably have a serious answer 
Well, then there would be a nice market for small EM pulse disruptors. So you'd just get, um, you know, you'd get a pulse disruptor like the size of a chapstick thing, and you just go bam. Or you could put all your devices into a bag that um, that disrupted them. Um, but more seriously, um, computers and technology are completely symbiotic. Uh, like computers and humans are completely symbiotic. Um, if those devices turned against us, there'd just simply be a recall and they wouldn't be allowed to reproduce. If you think about it, the devices at the fact there wouldn't be any more calls for that device at the factory. Literally, that device would go extinct, um, and you'd have it be replaced with, with better devices. And I don't think any of those are going to suddenly go weird. I think they're probably just going to have battery problems. Maybe the battery packs might explode if you try to put you know, too much charging power in a battery pack. Um, but you know, and, and I don't think Google cars will, you know, suddenly take off and drive around and destroy people, um, because really, when systems do that, it's because there's some human in the loop that's screwing things up. Um, on the other hand, you know, those systems better be programmed with the old, you know, with with the original idea behind computers, which was, you know, military and security and business. You couldn't have systems that failed. Um, you had to have systems that failed like 0.0001% and had to be able to calculate that failure rate. Um, you know, all of the planes are running on COBOL. Like the, all, you know, all the plane systems are running on a really old, you know, system made with code that's really tight and maybe it's a little bit weird, but um, it's really important to have systems like that. Um, so, you know, they might have weaknesses, but the idea behind a good programmer or a series of programmers is that you have all the different backups and you have all the different um, abilities to say, if this happens and this fails, then this system backs up, and then if this backs up, then this backs up. Honestly, if there's a lot of corruption in the system, then it just, just turns itself off. Um, the thing is, means will never have consciousness or, you know, minds or anything like that. So th they're not going to say, oh, I need to stay on all the time, unless somebody has programmed to do so. There's an, okay, so if you want to read about this, there's a really good book um, called Avogadro Corp. It's about a company loosely based on Google um, that is in Portland, Oregon, and it's all, all about this AI system who is programmed to make sure it has enough resources to survive and ends up taking over the entire world, and it's very cleverly written, um, but it's, you know, part of the plot is it, it mines all of the email data, so you know you could say, I want to ask my boss for promotion, and it would mine all of the emails that your boss has ever sent um, or received, and say, if you include golf, you'll have an 80% higher chance of getting that promotion, because all of the other emails that asked for a promotion um, had that. Um, just typing this into the chat, Avogadro Corp, like Avogadro's number. Um, so the you know so the idea behind that is um, the, the the system has access to everybody's email and actually starts asking for resources on on behalf of itself to all the members in this in this Avogadro company department and um, and because it knows how to persuade people because it knows whether people are likely to say yes or no based on the words that it uses um, it gets all the resources and ends up taking over um, and it's a really it's a really great look at what I would call organic artificial intelligence, where you have a system that evolves over time, um, kind of like humans have evolved over time, you know, a brain and a series of sensors that um, that have, you know, emotion and, and you know, curiosity and intelligence in them. And I don't really know where that comes from, because there are plenty of intelligent animals, too, out there. Um, but I guess once the sensors get sufficiently complex, you get something that's very different. Um, and so I'm not really worried about it, but I am worried about the programmers behind it. And if something gets very popular, but it's very badly written, um, it could cause people a lot of harm accidentally. And there will always need to be an off switch, I guess, um, or a distraction switch. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Uh, I'm going to check out that book as well. Um, so we have a, another question. Actually, uh, how much more time do you have, Amber? Do you have about like 15 more minutes? Is that OK? Yeah. Yeah, 15 minutes is good. Yeah. All right, cool. This is, yeah, I mean, we could probably sit here for hours. This is all really, really fascinating stuff, but we'll keep it at 15 more minutes and save the rest for Paris. Um, John Ramirez asked that. He said he really liked your TED Talk um, and wondered if you could expand on the concept of the extension of the mental self. 
Ah, okay, great. Yeah, good question. So the idea of the, sten of the extension of the mental self, um, it comes from, well, the concept that your brain automatically extends to the tools that you use. So when you get into a car, your, your brain actually extends and your physical self extends to the limits of the car. And that's how you know um, how far you are away from the curb when you park. That's how you know how far you are away from other cars when you drive down the street. Um, and if somebody gets too close or almost hits you, you feel it as if it were kind of a physical thing, right? You're, ah, um, even though you don't really feel anything at all um, because you're in, you're basically in, you know, this beetle-shaped, you know, machine that, that is an external exoskeleton when you drive down the street. Um, so the idea of the extension of the mental self is that um, unlike, you know, or, or basically like those physical objects that we extend ourselves into mentally and physically, we also have the same thing happen on sites like Facebook, where you've got technically a machine that you're interacting with, or a series of machines, and a virtual space. It's two-dimensional, it's mostly full of text, there are some pictures, yet your brain attaches to it and it becomes a part of yourself. So when you get a like on Facebook, you feel that like physiologically. Um, it, you know, it can help you feel better. Um, if somebody makes a bad comment, you feel it physiologically too. And so part of your brain is actually the shape of your online profile as well. It's kind of your second self. Um, and I think actually the idea of a second self is really dissolving because it's really your primary self. It's a vehicle through which you produce your identity or, or actually talk with people um, where it's not really that differentiated after a while from who you actually are. Um, when I first got on the web, I made a very good effort to have all sorts of different identities and experiment, and they were definitely different, you know, second and third selves or whatever. Um, but uh, as time went on, you know, Facebook, when you use your real name, you are more likely to talk about the mundane. You're, you're likely to talk about those really simple, silly things that happen in your life that, on the whole, are something that you just say to somebody next to you if you're in the room with them. You know, like, Oh, I forgot my bag this morning. Oh, I drank a cup of coffee. Oh, don't you hate it when the cup of coffee accidentally does this? Um, look, here's a picture of what I ate. Um, because it's, it's just an extension of, of your everyday life now. Um, if it wasn't, people would be blogging, basically, with it, or trying to make some, some prescribed text um, or you know, something that was more scripted. And because it's not like that, um, because we're so, we're so intertwined with it, um, it actually is a part of us. It's a new limb. It's a new sensory organ. Um, it's a new way to sense the world around us. Great. Uh, Colby, did you want to ask a question? Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute myself there. So mine comes from uh, an education background. Or I don't really have an education background, but it's something I read a lot about. When you watch small children specifically interact with themselves and start learning about time and space, uh, specifically space in themselves as well, becoming aware of when somebody leaves their vision that that person still exists because for a while they don't. Um, watching small children interact with mirrors and see themselves in mirrors and kind of uh, you know, invent their idea of that. What yeah. role could these technologies play, do you think, in an early childhood education setting? And where do you see that going forward? Great, great question. Um, well, I mean, you see it, it's just a general extension of play. And actually, not too many people have made apps based on this. This is actually funny. Um, when you actually watch a kid play, you know, they'll play doctor or they'll play um, house or, you know, I played urban planner and I made giant towns in my room um, out of cardboard boxes. Um, but technically, I mean, that's, that's the same thing that you can do on an iPad, right? The thing is you don't really get the physical understanding of what it's like to actually do that thing. Um, usually, you know, you'd go and get all the props, right? You have a costume thing. Like, okay, I've got a stethoscope today. I'm going to do this. And you try on the different roles. And once you find roles that, that you like and, and you fit into, um, you end up uh, you know, they might influence what you do later on in life. I played with Lake all all the time, and so that really influenced how I thought about the world and thought about reality. Um, some, you know, some people play with dolls, so you know they end up you know, doing well with kids or um, or, or things like that. So, um, if you play with those on, you know, on a digital surface, then then you can learn, right? But the other thing is, if you actually had 
and I'd love for this to happen. If you actually had a farming game, like a farm bill, um, that actually controlled farming equipment in some other country, and you had a bunch of three-year-olds playing it, uh, you could actually harvest a heck of a lot more crops. Um, there, there's a concept called the internet as playground and factory, where you, um, you think you're playing on the internet, but you're really actually doing work. So if a bunch of different, um, you know, if a bunch of different people randomly played, um, and they were looking at a cartoon version of a bunch of grapes, and they were picking them, and there was a machine in the background actually picking the grapes, um, you could turn all of that play into actual labor. And then, you know, if you got enough points, you could get a shipment of grapes to your house. That would be freaking hilarious. I don't know if there would be labor rights around that, because that's just a bunch of, you know, three to five-year-olds playing, or even cats, you know. Um, and of course, you would, you would filter out the people who didn't play very well um, and had a lot of mistakes. You would just automatically... Um, you would just automatically filter those out and not actually allow them to interact with the machines, and then all of the really good people would actually be controlling the machines. Um, and you could be able to tell after a few practice sessions whether somebody was good or not. I don't know if that's dystopic or utopic, or a bad thing to say or a good thing to say. I think it's a completely gray area. Um, but I think as a kid, if you have a simulation game, like you know, SimCity or The Sims, you can learn a heck of a lot more about reality without having to have all the physical stuff. Like, a lot of people are now growing up in small condos, they don't have backyards, they can't climb trees, um, they, you know, they're very protected by their parents. And you have this whole new genre of young adult fiction now, which is about this kind of dystopian future where there are no adults anymore. And I was asking my, um, my cousin about this, because she's a kindergarten teacher, and I said, why the heck is this going on? And she said, well, because when we were all kids, we could go and run for two days or, you know, go run anywhere, do anything we wanted, and technically there were no adults around and no one to actually curtail our behavior. Um, but now there are adults everywhere and they watch everything and usually, you know, you're allowed a bit of time online and you have structured activities like soccer and violin practice and flute and whatever you're doing. Um, so you don't have that ability to have unsupervised playtime and get hurt and fall and get scraped up and climb a bunch of trees and explore. And, and really reach the limits. So now you're doing that on something like Club Penguin, where you're hanging out with people from other countries, um, you're talking with them, but you're never actually physically leaving your house. Um, so the whole idea of these young adult fiction novels, of there being no parents around, is so that people can experience, so that young kids can experience what it was like to grow up, how their parents <coughs> might grow up with no parents around. Um, so <laughs> there's, there's, there's kind of these themes that are going on where, where people want to have their own community and you know simulations where you actually figure out how you can plant crops where you're actually learning that sort of thing in a game like system is really cool um, I would really like to see more educational games I don't know what happened but on the Apple II computer there was all these different like number cruncher and space blaster games where you could actually learn mathematics um, those don't really exist very much anymore even though we basically have a portable Apple II computer in our pockets now um, there, there just aren't a lot of really cool educational games anymore. Um, also, there needs to be, it would be really nice if you know, programming was done in a way that was very Lego-like, where you could place pieces of, I mean, in iPhone app development, it's kind of like this. You say, I want an audio unit, and I'll plug it in here, and I want this, but you still have to write a, a crap load of code and do provisioning, and it sucks. Um, when it becomes easy, uh, easy enough to write code as if you were making an animation flash, and flash is a horrible example, but it caused everybody to do things on the web. Um, then you'll have the whole, you know, interesting creativity of kids to build all sorts of stuff that, that no one had, has ever seen before. Um, so yeah, um, I would suggest uh, reading a book, um, Colby, called uh, Wanana, which is a really crazy book on the I think that's how you spell it. By Bruce Karen. It's a like I think it's like a little self-published book. It's totally unknown, but it's uh, it's a really weird look at the future of education. There's a, a game where all these people play it and it's a simulation game, you get trained. And whenever you get to the next level, you get a physical object. So like maybe I get a pen when I get to the first level in the mail. And then I notice as I'm walking around in you know uh, you know in the real world you know, people I go to school with, they all have these pens. Oh my gosh, fascinating. Um, 
you know, that person also is playing the game, you know, and then you go to level two and maybe you get, like, you know, I don't know, coconut water or something like that. Uh, oh my gosh, all these people have this thing. Um, so it's kind of this game of symbols, and that encourages people outside of an education system to actually, um, to learn, because they're so incentivized about looking cooler and raising up through the levels so that they can interact with the cooler peers that have the better stuff. It's very consumptive-based, but it's a cool book, so I'd, I'd highly suggest reading that. I think I, I deviated into like 20 topics during trying to answer your question, but thanks for your question. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it made me think as well of uh, Ubuli, who's going to be speaking at the web as well, where oh, they cool. create the actual, it's like a physical toy that you slide the iPhone into, and it creates the face, and it, you can interact with it, and it asks questions, and um, kids really engage with it, and they constantly are updating it with new content, and uh, they're working on things to help uh, kids with learning deficiencies and different kinds of problems, so it's pretty interesting. Awesome. Um, we'll wrap it up here. One last question, which I think is pretty apt way to wrap it up, is so we have all this uh, amazing technology that's coming out and like impacting the way we live and the way we survive in society pretty much. Um, and so Andy, actually, he asked a question before. He has another good one. Andy Sig said, uh, maybe the urgent subject to address here is the legislative context of technology. How can we carry our politicians along with us as the high-tech landscape changes? And then on the other end of it, like how do we um, make sure that we have the right kind of uh, legal things in place that will prevent uh, the abuse of these kinds of technologies? That's a good question. Um, well, there's two things that I usually see around you know, the shape of the Internet. You usually have new systems that come about. Initially, when they come about, they're very, very open. Uh, you can do anything on them. You can do anything on the internet. You can do anything on a BBS system. You can do anything with email. And then after a while, you know, spam shows up, or um, people start um, abusing the system. Like Twitter, there's a bunch of different bots that look like really, you know, sexy women, but they're really just bots. Um, and uh, and so that's you know that's kind of a big issue. Um, but uh, and then over time, a system gets closed off because legislation starts coming in and, and trying to make rules around it. Um, one of the problems is that a lot of people in Congress are not really moving at the speed of the Internet, and that's probably okay. The idea of Congress is to act slowly um, and act more theoretically so that we don't sidestep you know, how, how things should work. I, although a lot of people don't really have a historical perspective. Um, you know, the whole point of Plato writing the Republic is so that he could try and understand, you know, here's a society that could last for a very long time, and here's how it works. And I'm not saying that all the Congress people should look at Plato's Republic, but there's a lot of stuff that stays the same no matter what type of technology happens. There's a lot of issues in human rights. Um, there's a lot of issues in, in allowing people to do X or Y. And people need to stop looking at the Internet as a thing and actually just look at... Um, the same thing is happening and being produced through a new interface. Let's figure out the thing that's being produced through the interface and then apply the same rules that we have in reality that have worked so well over time and discard the ones that you know haven't worked. Because usually there's a knee-jerk reaction. It's, oh no, let's just close down this or you know, let's, let's cause this to be too open or, um, or you know, let's, uh, let's not act until it's a big problem because we don't know what this new interface is. Um, you know, the whole, what was it, maybe it was on Google Plus or, or Google Buzz or uh, one of the earlier incarnations of this platform um, where people were automatically subscribed to updates of people that they had email addresses of and so people were freaking out because they were seeing their ex-wife or stalker or something like that on the interface. Um, there should be a rule against that. Um, but the issue is that you often don't know what the rules should be until they're broken. And Facebook is really good at just breaking rules really quickly and then, you know, cleaning up the pieces and making a better interface for somebody. So I think if Congress is too involved, it's not, the innovation won't be there, um, but there should be some general laws that are put in place so that people are protected, like privacy laws, for instance, because we've got, we have a system right now, especially in America, where people trust um, business and they don't trust um, government which is odd because government's there to protect people and business has business interests in mind, um, especially if they have investors. So there's a lot of businesses that are taking advantage of people's data, selling it, um, 
And it's not really that you need to be afraid of, you know, somebody stalking you. It's that you need to be afraid of a business stalking you. People are no f longer afraid of junk email, or sorry, junk email or junk mail that physically comes to your address. But every time you get a piece of junk mail, it's because there's a hole in your privacy that's been compromised by a third-party company. But no one just looks at their junk mail and says, oh, no, my privacy has been compromised. I am terrified. Somebody needs to regulate this. There's always going to be slippery, weird holes in the system, and I think if people communicate with each other and have guidelines around it, they'll be more educated about it so that you know they don't leave their Facebook profile hanging open all the time. And there should, there should be a term for it when your Facebook profile is open, like the equivalent of, you know, um, you know, your fly is unzipped or something like that, because that's, you know, people should have that kind of public understanding that, you know, oops, something's open, like, oh, you forgot to wear pants to class today, like, you know, your Facebook profile is open. Um, when you log on to Facebook, you don't really get that impression. And I think that should be a little bit more clear so that people don't have to be educated as much about it. But I don't know what Congress can do except for make it easier to innovate um, and make it easier to be dynamic, but still protect some of our basic rights, like privacy and security. Um, I don't know if Germany overdoes it, but people are really great about privacy there. Um, and, you know, I feel really safe when I'm over there because oh, my privacy is protected. That's great. In some cases, it's really important to have your privacy compromised so that people can find out where you are and come and save you. Um, so it really depends on, on the situation. Um, but I think, you know, always with any government, there's going to be modernists and there's going to be old-fashioned people and they're going to fight and then the whole era will shift and then, um, you know, those new people will, will show up and, and start helping out. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I, I kind of just watch politics from the sidelines because I, I think of it like a game of, of cowboys and Indians and, you know, someone's mom needs to call them all home for dinner. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, it's really, really good stuff. I, we have like a thousand more questions, but we're going to save it now for Paris. Um, Amber, what, what day are you speaking? Um, I think the 5th. The 5th. So okay. you'll be able to see her live on YouTube if you're not going to be in Paris at the web. Um, you'll be able to watch everything live, or if you're in Paris, you should definitely come see her because the talk's going to be just as fascinating as this hangout was. Um, well, let's uh, announce our winner of the free ticket here real quick. Uh, he asked a couple really good questions. So Andy Sig, uh, you're going to win a free ticket to the web, so congratulations. Thanks for asking really good questions. You almost stumped her, but I don't think anyone stumped her. <laughs> um, uh, thanks to everyone who joined the hangout, and... Uh, everyone who asked good questions in here as well. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you all in Paris in five days on Tuesday. So coming up very quickly. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been really awesome to be here. And uh, I'm so glad the um, the Internet was fast enough to see everybody. So thanks again. And I'll see you. Amber's in Hawaii, so she took an hour out of her beautiful day in Hawaii to <laughs> hang out with us. All righty. Well, thanks so much for your time, Amber. We'll see you in Paris, and thanks to everyone else. Uh, we'll see you soon. Cool. Bye. See you all.